For decades, New Zealanders have been flocking across the Tasman to settle in Australia. Many have since become household names here and all over the world. Tonight, we meet one of these famous Kiwis and ask them why they left their homeland and where do they think the grass is greener. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Harry M. Miller. And when I first went to America, people had no idea, no idea where New Zealand was. It was really depressing. They still don't have too much idea. But I remember when I went in to buy Louis Armstrong, first trip to America, and I was living in New Zealand and putting, starting to put shows on here in Australia. And I go to the 22nd floor of this building to meet Louis Armstrong's manager. And I do my normal routine about we don't have any money, would he like to come for a holiday and all that stuff. And this guy said, this is a long time ago, he said, uh, you got any bucks, kid? And I'm looking at him and I said, well, no. He said, Louie needs 6,000 bucks a show. $6,000 a show. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, Mr. Glazer, I can't, he's one of the biggest agents in America. I said, I can't pay $6,000. I come from New Zealand. We're very poor. The grass is not green there. And he calls, he yells at the top of his voice, Francis! And Francis was an old hoofer, dancer from the Copacabana nightclub. He said, throw this bastard out of here. He ain't got no bucks. And I thought, my God, this is my first chance in shape. I'm 22 <laughs> floors up, and he's going to throw me out the window. And I was terrified. So what was the tag? Did you get the show? We got the show, but had to pay the 6,000 bucks. Yep, <laughs> Well, that's the story of Harry and so you always find it. You've got to save the story. Leaving New Zealand for Australia more than 30 years ago has allowed me to look at horizons and goals and fulfilment within myself and work-wise, personally, that I would never have been able to achieve in New Zealand, simply because in the area that I work in, not possible to. And so I guess I'm a, a fuller, a more capable person, more, not more content. I think you could be very content fishing on the shores of Lake Taupo, if that's what you wanted to do. But I, I've been able to achieve things here that it would have been impossible for me to achieve in New Zealand. And, and so I've been very lucky, really, really lucky. Australian Jewish Times. He's wonderful. Very funny guy. And ever since we came to Australia, like 27 years ago, he's always supported our, all of our shows, all of our business, always writes reviews, even if the place was empty, so it was fantastic. Very good. Very loyal. When we went to Australia, incredible things happened. I mean, you have no idea how vicious people will be. I was regarded as a pimply-faced youth. And, I mean, they sort of said, well, here's this upstart, you know, from Kiwiland. And uh, people did incredible things to stop us getting in. What sort of things? Things like um, ringing up uh, a printer and saying, um, if you print program books for him, you'll never print them for us. I mean, ringing up PR people and saying, if you do a job for him, you'll never do a job for us. Uh, awful things. Not letting you have theatres, not letting you rent venues just making life very, very difficult.
When I first tried to bring here to Melbourne, the problem was that all of the conservative managements blocked us out. And so I had to do what I did in Sydney, which was find a legitimate film cinema and just wreck it. Um, this was a beautiful theatre with lovely carpet and beautiful walls and plaster and angels and little people everywhere. And we fixed that within a month. We turned it into some sort of debauched, uh, you know, LSD dream, which was what here was all about. Because in those days, you know, people thought that grass was something that you made on a Saturday morning. The Melbourne production of Hair is probably the best indication of what makes Harry run. It's himself. Disarmingly, he laments that he has no competition, so he runs against his own last effort. We're in a bit of a jam up here, and it's a bloody mess. And um, some full drill, 3,800 holes, the wrong size, the rainbow isn't up, which we'll see when we get there. So what we're going to do now is try and put the heat on everybody without breaking them in half. And I'm afraid that everybody's almost at breaking point. Even the tiniest detail has to be checked by Mr. Miller. He's Mr. Miller to his staff, never Harry. Brian Thompson, who's a very clever designer, invented a rainbow which went over the whole stage. Seven different colours of the rainbow. Massively expensive in those days. Cost about, I think it cost us $6,000, all these bulbs and all these colours. And they're running over budget. And so Freddie Gibson, who was the general manager of the company, he made a decision without talking to me and the designer brian thompson came into my office one afternoon crying absolutely tears streaming out of the face in despair because freddie gibson in an effort to cut down the budget had said well you'll just have to manage with a three color rainbow so i said put everybody into cheaper hotels we'll keep the rainbow and that's what happened i think the the important thing i learned from working with harry is um, absolutely not to compromise and and to go for to go for your idea, um, and that's not there anymore. I mean that sort of um, un uncompromising um, direction. Uh, it's there from uh, directors and from other people in the business, but certainly not from producers. And we need, we very much need something like that from Harry. I mean, I think that if I was to, to have compromised my ideas, we wouldn't be sitting. I wouldn't be sitting here today <laughs> in this. People often say to me, "What was the best performance ever?" of hair and the best performance was the, the Saturday before we opened the week before we opened and we, it was full of university students full thousand people and when they did that number three five zero everybody in the audience was crying and when I you sort of think about it now you choke you can't help it you know it was really amazing and I think that people don't understand those things anymore, and it was really important. I felt as though I was really helping do something worthwhile, and, and that's what theatre's all about. If you've got to be at the front here, you push yourself, people hate you for it, um, but you have to live through that. I think the, the tragic thing about New Zealand is, irrespective of what political party is in, they both look after the people, overlook after them. It is still a cradle to the grave security system and I think that's bad um, I don't believe that anybody owes you a free lunch but people still sort of look at the grass outside on the street and think oh, I won't mate that that's a council's job it's always somebody else's job um, not too many people are in their offices before seven o'clock in the morning in anywhere in Auckland or anywhere in New Zealand there's damned all people there after five morning Harry and Miller group this is Margaret what can I do for you Mask is calling. Is that the house? That's the question. Is that the house? Mr. Miller? Yeah. Ian Patterson from the land, line 10. G'day. Yeah, I've got to speak to him again uh, as soon as I get off the phone here. Uh, so I'll talk to him read that job. And, um, Do you want me to something? Yeah. Hang on one second, Glenn. G'day. Now that's, that's absolutely. The, the Bible, boy. First rule of talkback radio. Is this call taking my career anywhere? If not, hang up. Glenn? Is Helen there, please? Hang on. Glenn? Yeah. Yeah, sorry. My life is about work, so I couldn't not work, whatever it was I was doing. I, I love it. And I, I, I get up every morning and I think, gee, this is a great 
day to work. I have some fun. If I'm doing anything, I'm trying to separate now a bit more fun. And I think if there's any problem that I see around the world now, it's people don't want to work because they're bloody lazy or they're doing the wrong job. I am, I think, perfectly cast, so I don't want to be something else. I'm quite happy being me. I think he's responsible for having brought some very professional and very fair contracts into Bear. And I think that's, again, what makes him a very good agent. He's, he's uh, I mean, he, Harry always says it's got to be a deal that works for both parties. And uh, I think that he's been able to achieve that. He will talk honestly and frankly, which one wants. And then, if he feels the right is on my side, he will go in with all guns blazing and the machine guns and the tank follow-ups and the lot. If he thinks I'm wrong, he will discuss this with me with, with cool, clear intelligence and, and, and make me realise something. I mean, I'll be the first to admit that he has, in many instances, shown me the light, as it were. Harry Miller climbed the theatrical Everest in Australia. The perception was that you never would see live theatre, not of the, not the big spectacular. Uh, that was at the West End and Broadway, and after that, forget it. It wasn't ever going to come here. Now, of course, we take it for granted. It's axiomatic that you're going to see Phantom of the Opera, you're going to see AVT, you're going to see uh, whatever it is that's on the West End will come here. Now, when Judy Garland was the Wizard of Oz, and just this elusive, beautiful, alluring lady whom everybody loved and could never see, Harry Miller brought it to Australia. People actually said, I saw Judy Garland. And then Arthur Rubenstein was the greatest pianist ever. I heard him play in Sydney. I mean, albeit it was at the stadium, we never had anywhere for them to perform. It was a down market, derelict outfit, but Harry Miller brought them here. You know, behind this rather seamy, undistinguished building, we built, when Judy Garland was here, the most fantastic dressing room. It was just like Cleopatra's palace down there. I guess the woman gave me the biggest highs that I'd had in years, or to that time, and the biggest lows, or the lowest lows, which was just awful. By the time we got to Melbourne, she was pretty well gone. She was very drunk, she was on antidepressants and those sort of drugs. And uh, we couldn't get her out of the hotel, and so I was standing in this hall, waiting. We were an hour and a half late. Gary was trying to spoon her out of the hotel. So finally a message came through that she'd left the hotel, and I had written out on a piece of paper, because I was careful not to say she was going to perform, to announce that, ladies and gentlemen, we are pleased to advise you that Judy Garland has left the hotel and is on her way to Festival Hall. So I'm standing down the bottom of the stairway in the auditorium, and suddenly I hear this clown, instead of reading this bit of paper, say, well, folks, I suppose you notice we're a bit late starting. And as I heard those words, I must have sprung up these three flights of stairs, about six at a time, bounced across the room, grabbed this guy by the shirt, and with one hand, I threw him across the sound booth. Obviously, silence the announcement, and we got somebody to read it as I'd written it. It's a pretty horrendous night. We did the very first concert version of Jesus Christ Superstar out of out of New York. It's the first production in the world. Wonderful atmosphere, and, and on this court, um, I've never felt electricity like it, except for ten or twelve of the other things I've done that were pretty exciting. But it was an amazing night. Amazing stars everywhere. Uh, there's a very strange um, minister. And he phoned me up one day and said, my son, the Lord has chosen you to put on the show. And I looked up that night and I thought, maybe he has. <laughs> Right here, in this building, was where we did assault in Melbourne with boys in a band. It was horrendous because the government didn't want us to do it, the government of the day. They tried everything to stop the play coming. And even right up until the opening night, kept hassling us about fire exits and things. And I'll never forget, there was a wonderful architect called Gordon Banfield who kept saying it won't happen. I said, they're not going to let us open if we don't have an extra doorway. And we had to cut the doorway in that second doorway, and I'm telling you that on the night, as the people were walking in that door, Gordon Banfield was down there with a trowel smoothing the cement on these bloody steps that we had to build. It was horrendous, um, because they just didn't want it to happen. It was probably the most moral play of its day, an amazing play, just a mirror on homosexuality and the tragedy and the humour and so on. I have never fought so hard in my life 
over censorship as we did for Boys in the Band. And my partners of the day wanted us to change the words for Melbourne, and I wouldn't. I just wouldn't, because I had made a commitment to the author in America, Mark Crowley, that I would put that play on as he wrote it. Never before has a stage show, apart from a strip show, been charged with indecency. The editor of the Catholic newspaper, Zolandia, told the court he was disgusted and shocked by some of the language and some of the actions involved in the production. He said scenes of simulated sexual intercourse, masturbation, sodomy and oral sex were performed by male and female members of the cast. He also told of the use of four-letter words and variations on one four-letter word in particular. People were very narrow-minded there and very, very pro pro-prudy, pro-censorship about everything. And I, I mean, the act of censorship is in itself, I believe, one of the greatest obscenities on earth. Um, we had terrible fights in New Zealand over those sort of things. The very new things don't work there readily because the people haven't been exposed to the four things that led to that next step. That's nothing to do with New Zealanders, it's just to do with people being informed and experiencing things. I think New Zealand people are generally softer than Australian people. I think Australian people still are a bit harsh and a bit brash, generally. I think country people are identical, um, but not city people. Um, and But the real difference, I think, between the two countries is that in Australia you're totally stimulated and you can re-stimulate yourself with the environment and, and the stimulation that other people are putting out. In New Zealand, you don't have that wind-up. A building like the Victorian Arts Centre, like the Art Gallery next door to it, they're, they're human resources. I've always believed that art galleries, theatres, they're, they're like parks and beaches. I mean, they're there, they belong to the people, not for some ridiculous elite. It's one of the great sadnesses that New Zealand uh, has that they, nobody's ever really cared enough about the cultural and the aesthetic development of human beings. I'm not just talking about opera and ballet, I'm talking about letting people be exposed to interesting things. When I was the, uh, one of the trustees of the Art Gallery in Sydney, I used to just be thrilled to watch taxi drivers come in and look at that Jackson Pollock that Gough Whitlam bought. You know, outraged at one minute and then surprised by the effect that the picture had on them at their level and just very important for people to to touch and feel and experience good things it's funny really because when i run past this building every morning on my way around the Christ chair i look and think about those amazing days when i was on the council of the art gallery society and they they asked me to stand for president after about three years and i said i'll do it if there's no other people because i didn't want the society to be divided to my amazement in the last four or five weeks an art critic called mervyn horton stood and it really divided the council we're a long established thing and we have to keep a certain dignity about the whole thing i don't mean a stuffy dignity but it must be continuing thing do you think mr harry and miller in the presidency would mean a loss of dignity <laughs> not going to answer that not at all no the role of the art gallery society is to make a bridge between the gallery and the people um, with pr with education and it's a bridge over which there ought to be an awful lot of traffic four-lane highway if you like not some uh, private leafy little road uh, for an elitist group to drive up against it. With any new thing, you just gotta say, okay, some of those bastards out there are gonna hate this idea, and that's it, and you just put it aside, recognize it, and charge on. Because there's no, uh, you can't just spend your life worrying about whether everybody uh, is pleased. I think that one of the things I've learned in life is that, I don't know what the formula for success is, but the formula for failure is to try and please everybody. I need the land, I need to walk on it, to touch it, to feel it, to stand out in the rain, all those kind of things. And I think it just sort of completes the circle for you. It, it closes the gap and makes you a whole if you have those kind of things. And I, for me anyway, it's really important. You know, when I started, 15 years old, on the Haraki Plains working for Digger James, his farm I think was 110 acres. We don't have a paddock that small. The big difference is the grass in New Zealand is a lot greener than it is here. A lot greener. Dunmore is 
just on 11,000 acres. Runs a herd of about 850 breeding cows, plus all the followers, because we produce about 150 bulls a year. Importantly, this whole herd started really in two ways. Um, we cross-breeded with, um, with Hereford cows from Australia and artificial insemination, but the major contribution where we did all our ovum transplant techniques was from New Zealand, where we brought in 14 young 10-month-old heifers. And it's from that New Zealand base that we built this entire stud. This is not the manager of the concert division, this is the orchestra manager. No, the manager of the concert division is here. A woman? A woman. At the ABC? <laughs> No, 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 no. We're talking about the ABC now. That's right. Nothing is actually quiet, and uh, even our work meetings are just a theatre, and I guess Harry's got the ability to turn anything into a theatrical event. And not every day does the George Street traffic stop for bullocks, correction, bulls, to pass by on the way to the sale pen. That the sale pen is in the plushest part of a plush Asian-owned pub, now that's unusual. 5,000, 4,000? Well, who's got a quick start of 2,000? Thank you very much out there. 3,000. I bet 3,000 you're gone again. Your man's out there in the top left corner. Start a man, you're gone now. No, you're out. I bet 3,000. I bet 3,000. I bet 4,000. I'll take fives around the ring. But I've got a bit 3,000. I bet 3,000. I bet 4. Done a bit once, bit twice. Done the more. But I've got a bit 3. Come on. You can buy them. I now am ready in myself to return to my roots, which is to the theatre, and that's why we're doing Jesus Christ Superstar, that's why we're doing Ian Butterfly, that's why we're doing this amazing Star Trek thing, and I'm now talking and looking at things to do all the time in that area. Our management business is very strong and is our core business, as is our Speakers Bureau, but for me, I've got some free me around and I'm prepared to give it to a few more people now. New Zealand was my training ground. I learned to love to work, working for one man, a man called Jack Nyman, who taught me everything I know uh, in Auckland. Fantastic teacher, because it's wonderful for somebody to teach you to love your work. That's, that's a good thing to learn. So, but I wasn't able to implement that love fully uh, until, I guess, I turned from a caterpillar into a, um, a moth um, uh, when I came over here.